Hello friends, it's me, and today, Family Secrets, Family Cookbook. Let's check out Food Theory. I cooked 100 year old family recipes from the Food Theories. Together, let's go. This one's for you, Grandpa. Hello Internet, welcome to Food Theory. The sh Hello Internet, welcome to Food Theory. Show that fills your stomach and your heart. After so many years online, it really feels like there's not a lot left that you have to learn about me. And yet, did you know that I actually come from a Polish family? Yeah, it's not something oh. that you'd expect from a Matthew Patrick, but it's true. Polish, Czech, and Slovak. It's not really something that I think about myself all that often, and yet, I grew up with polka parties playing in my grandparents' house, munching down on pierogi and kolachki, foods that are spelled with way too many consonants next to each other. You know that you're dealing with a serious dish when you see the letters C, Z, and K all mixed together. That right there, that's a Polish dish. But as a picky eater growing up, I was scared of a lot of those traditional family foods. Pots stewing all day filled to the brim with cabbages, kielbasas, sauerkrauts, sour soups with- That's not nice. Don't be a picky eater pungent smells that seeped into every fabric of the house. They were always there, hanging out on the stovetop, but I never really would eat them. Heck, I would barely even try them. They were just weird. No, my meals typically tended to stay squarely in the standard American diet. Burgers, pizza, fries. But a little while back, I came across a number of recipes that were given to me by my late grandfather. Well, technically, he left them to Stephanie because, uh, he knew just how bad I was in the kitchen. They'd been sitting in a closet, hanging- <laughs> The grandfather is like, Ah, all my family secrets. Can we trust our grandchild? Mm, his wife! Out in an accordion folder, so we decided to take them out and put them into a cookbook so they'd be easier to save, but never really had an intention to do anything with them. I mean, who really wants to take a day and make a bunch of cabbage soup, right? Well, you know what? Today, I do. This episode's something that's been on my mind a lot lately. Thinking about memories, family, legacy, impact. Maybe it's because- Especially when you are retiring, when you are- leaving a legacy behind my pet. We've been going through and crossing off all these episodes on my to-do list, and it's just gotten me to think further and further back. And when I stop and actually assess it, I'm not really connected to that family history anymore. I mean, I Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Zero, zero. I've watched you for decades, and you have made zero references. Absolute zero. You don't. From what I know of you, you were never a family guy. Oh, fa traditional family guy. You're more of a modern family guy so i'm glad that you have a small turn towards a traditional side of you it's just a small turn but it's better than nothing you know pull out the cookbook and i can't even pronounce half the dishes that are inside of this thing i can't even pronounce this this is kreplach kreplach soup luckily we have the power of editing on our side voiceover just just move your mouth and then you can put it in afterwards yeah here we go this is one of my grandpa's favorite ponchki recipes right here wow isn't that amazing don't you love ponchki oh my gosh ponchki it's my favorite <laughs> Mm. It's almost my favorite food. I could say it all day. Ponchki, 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 ponchki. There it is. I know, I know. It's like I'm fluent or something. But in all seriousness, one of the things that struck me recently was that as an only child, without me cooking these recipes, without me passing them on, they disappear. That part of my heritage just goes away. And so weird. And that's the unfortunate thing. It's happened to Matt Pets, your generations, and it's happening to your true generations. Matt Pets, you only have a. You only have one child. You only have one son, one five years old son. He is in the same situation as you. Please don't make the same mistake again. All the responsibilities, expectations, burdens, pressure is placed on one single child. If the one single child doesn't live up to expectations, doesn't live up to responsibility, the family heritage die. I repeat again. The family heritage die. Don't, don't make that same mistake again. You are still young. Your wife is still able to get pregnant. Have a, have a second child, have a third child, have a fourth child. Don't put all the pressure onto one single son. Don't do that. Please. 
it or not, I kind of owe it to myself and to my grandfather and to everyone before him to keep those recipes alive. Cabbage or no cabbage. But I gotta admit, one of the reasons why I haven't dove into this is because when I was a kid, I was scared of a lot of the recipes. I didn't actually eat a lot of my grandparents' cooking back in the day because it always smelled weird. But I think since being a kid, my flavor palette has really grown and my appreciation of different ethnicities of food has really expanded a lot. So I think I've evolved enough as a human being to test out some of my grandpa's favorite recipes. And I'm not the only one. I've invited some other members of Team Theorist, including editor Gerardo, graphic artist Nicole, and of course, Steph, to join me in cooking some of their own family recipes. That way we Hi Gerardo, hi Nicole, hi Steph. We can all take some time to connect with our past and see whether keeping these family recipes alive is a tradition that's outdated or whether there's some kind of magic hidden inside those long forgotten cookbooks. So where does the tradition of family recipes really come from? You would think that we've been passing down recipes for as long as we've been around on the planet, but you gotta remember that our early days were more hunt, kill, eat, unless, huh, I wonder if that mammoth is gonna partner well with some pomegranates. We only actually started cooking with fire around 780,000 years ago. That that sounds old, well, remember, mankind is like two million years old. And if you thought recipes would follow soon after, well, you'd be wrong. We can assume that they were passed down through word of mouth, but as far as written recipes go, we're gonna have to fast forward just a wee bit, a couple hundred thousand years or so, to when the concept of reading and writing was invented. The oldest written recipes known to us date back to 1730 BC, and include ingredients for about 25 stews and broths, as well as some basic cooking instructions. There's even suggestions in there for presentation. Just imagine, a 4,000 year old Gordon Ramsay chiseling out how to prepare a lamb stew into a slab of rock. But even then, recipes were a far cry from what we're used to today. They were written more narratively because they were typically dictated to the person who was actively doing the chiseling. But there was still something else standing- Well, I will guess that chiseled sculpture will have a lot of vulgarities, a lot of bad words, a lot of curse words, mm-hmm in the way of family recipes being passed down after this. Literacy wasn't exactly the best. Rare were those that knew how to write, and even rarer were those who could read. Not only that, mass printing was not a thing, so it was fairly costly to make cookbooks. That's why the earliest cookbooks were actually for royalty. The first modern cookbook was published in 1390 for King Richard II, so that his servants, more than likely, would cook the recipes for him. Don't really see old Rich there throwing on an apron and getting down in the kitchen. But finally, a couple centuries later with the advent of mass printing, literacy rates started to rise and the luxury of cookbooks started to wane as more and more common folk were trying to get their hands on them. Cookbooks then continued to evolve until we finally started getting the modern cookbook in the 19th century. But the best thing about people learning to read and write was that they could start recording their own personal recipes and techniques, allowing them to develop their family recipes in order to pass down from generation to generation. That's what makes these things so special, is the fact that they become inextricably linked to the family itself, their heritage, their culture. But as time has gone on, things like family dinner, with multiple dishes and hours of preparation, it's becoming harder to have. For most of us, we get back home from work and we have to scramble to make something quickly for our families, or we get in the car and just drive to the Olive Garden to feast on a basket of breadsticks. Over time, at least for me, the history in these recipes has become forgotten, neglected, relegated to just a dusty shelf in the kitchen. I have never made any of these before. Now I... you can atone. You can atone yeah. for your past and be ready to embrace your family heritage. Yeah, that's, I mean, sad that it's coming so late in the game, but I'm excited to finally tackle these favorite favorite soups. So here is sad that it, it's so late in the game. But that late than ever, I guess. Here we go. This is the kielbasa and cabbage soup, which is basically a whole lot of kielbasa, a whole lot of cabbage and some soup. And and the soup. Like it is basically what you see on the tin. There's yeah. not a whole lot of explanation needed there. And then throw them in the pot to uh steep, yeah. saute. Simmer? To soup. Soup. To, to soup. soup. To whatever soup. whatever cooking process happens to turn ingredients into soup, that's what we're gonna be gonna doing. Do that one. So since this is a food channel, I feel compelled to clarify that when it comes to soup making, you simmer, which involves cooking the ingredients in a liquid just below boiling. That is the primary method of cooking soup. But as we began to prepare the ingredients to start our souping, there was one thing that kept nagging at my mind. Here's my question, oh, wait, Steph. I just saw something. Soup making, wait. you simmer, which involves cooking the ingredients in a liquid just below boiling. That is the primary method of cooking soup. But as we began to prepare the- If you look at the left side, ingredients, cabbage, tomatoes, J U L two zero D. Is that a code? Ingredients to start our souping. There was one thing that kept nagging at my mind. Here's my question, Steph. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you enjoy the smell of your own farts? What? No. <laughs> 
Just in case you're wondering where that came from, clearly it was the cabbage. Cabbage makes you stinky. And when you're prepping to eat a whole head of cabbage as part of your family soup recipe, you batten down the hatches for some serious smell. There is a silent but deadly gene. I got that. It's pretty odiferous. This is coming up as you're like one of your last ever food theories because you're like basically nothing matters anymore. And there's there are no steaks in this show at all. But anymore. there is a lot of kielbasa. <laughs> no steaks. If I'm going out, wow. I'm going out with a bang and a toot. <laughs> Plumbing your family's past, you're just gonna make sure that everything is accurate. I, I, oh, I'm not what? plumbing. I'm not plumbing the past. I'm cleaning the pipes. <laughs> so I think the kobas is brown. <laughs> you're welcome, friends, for the deep Matt Pat lore that obviously you've been craving all these years. Yep, very deep. <laughs> I find my, I, I, th I think my farts smell pretty nice. They're kind of silent but deadly, though. I can tell you, that's not true. Yeah, from an outsider's perspective. I said, do you like the smell of your own farts? Uh, I think your is, farts are also pretty unpleasant. The answer is no. The answer is no on both counts. And, dude, you're my best friend. We are best friends. But you can clear her room. Yeah, it's pretty powerful. I think I inherited it from my mom. Yeah. Who I think inherited it from my grandpa. Who ate a lot of cabbage? <laughs> so, with our stove and our my cabbage house. Her bowels working hard. It's time to go check in with our other team members, huh? We got editor Gerardo, who's making the traditional Colombian dish, Ayaco. Another family soup, but this one with 100% less cabbage. Instead, you're looking at chicken, three different kinds of potatoes, and a unique herb known as guasca. And the ingredients, not easy to find stateside. Something that Gerardo took personal offense to. But it's not the same, man. It's, you just have to feel it. Going a little further down geographically, we have Nicole making charquicon from Chile. And that's Chile the country, not Chile the dish. In fact, this dish contains no chili. Instead, it contains potato, pumpkin, corn, and most importantly, charqui. What's charqui, you ask, and why does it sound like I coughed in the middle of saying the word jerky? Well, because they're one and the same. In fact, jerky is derived from the word chaarqui in Quechua, the indigenous language family from the Andean region of South America. But perhaps the craziest thing about Nicole's dish is that she's going purely off memory from a very long time ago. I haven't tried this recipe in over 16 years, since I was like 19 or something. I don't even remember how it tastes i just remember slight memories of this dish but yeah i am pretty excited if i tried going off book for the recipe that we're preparing this episode would have just been me running around 16 minutes with smoke detectors going off good on you nicole but back to our kitchen where it's time for us to get started on the final dish of the day stephanie's bacala fritters so now that my family recipe is on the stove it's time to switch over to steph and take the fish out of the bathtub? Yeah, exactly. My family recipe is one I'm very excited about and it actually takes a combination of two of my other favorite family recipes and brings them together. The two family recipes that I really wanted to kind of uh, try to incorporate into this episode were one, my family's uh, fried dough recipe, which is basically just fried pizza dough. You can do it savory, you can do it sweet, you can sprinkle it with powdered sugar. It's like the best thing I've ever eaten in my life. And it's, but it's too, it's too easy. It's like kind of too simple. Ugh, yeah, easy mode. Come On the on. other end. <laughs> I just like it that the easiest thing is like, mm, difficult for my pet. Mm of things, I wanted to incorporate my um, dad and my grandma's bacala recipe. So bacala, if you're not familiar with it, is dried salted cod. You buy it outside of the refrigerator section. It's literally like a salted preserved fish and it comes in this big slab. Do you buy it? Where where are you finding this? Yeah, you can buy it at some specialty grocery stores. We get it at the Asian grocery store because they also use salt, dried salted fish. It's yeah. the same kind of thing. It's also in South America. It's in Mexico. I mean, everybody like has versions of bacala. And so it's, it's actually like not that uncommon, but it's pretty uncommon in the US. So we got some. And the way that you prepare it is first you have to get all the salt out before you can actually use it. And you could do that by just putting it in a big pot and leaving it to soak for a while. But if you're doing it the real grandma way, you soak it in the bathtub for 48 hours. <laughs> and so that's what we did. We took it downstairs to the office. We chucked her in the bathtub and you know, you change the water every few hours and stuff like that. 
and it she comes out. the water every few hours. Well, you wouldn't sit in a bathtub for more than a few hours with the same water. That would just be unhygienic. In any case, this high-maintenance slab of salted fish is the key ingredient. And for those of you wondering... So I'm gonna guess for the past two days, no, I used the bathtub. ...and why we'd buy a salted fish just to remove all the salt in a bathtub, it's because the salt is actually used as a preservative, not for flavoring. So the idea is to rehydrate it to remove the salt so you can re-season it into whatever you're cooking. It's a very... Bye-bye for the next 48 hours. ...demanding fish, but Steph assured me I had to wait and judge for myself. It's deep fried, it's amazing, it comes out this like awesome golden brown. I I think I'm gonna have like the winning recipe of the day and also honor my ancestors appropriately. Sorry, can I just call out the fact that at no point throughout this episode has this ever been a competition and then <laughs> Stephanie starts talking and all of a sudden there's clear winners and losers with our ancestors, Stephanie. I don't know. <laughs> with our ancestors! <laughs> What you're talking about. Our ancestral recipes, and you're like, I'm gonna win. It's not a competition. <laughs> is it not though? Stephanie's Italian side is showing. If it's a competition, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna bet that my friend is gonna lose to his wife. Reason being, he, he, he told us he's bad in the kitchen. Yeah, definitely hard in this episode. But in all honesty, once we started cooking and trying the components, her recipe was delicious. Before you go for it, I'm gonna take a little bite of this what? guy. Yeah, yeah, try it, try it. Ooh. Yeah, it's really Ooh. good. Uh-huh. Oh, that's really Ooh. good. It is mm -hmm. crispy on the outside and gooey on the inside. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Oh, that's pleasant. Mm -hmm. That's a really nice texture. Okay. Gotta admit, I was getting pretty hyped for this one. But then I remembered that smack dab in the middle of that delicious dough, we were going to be putting a bunch of salted fish. Yum. I decided to mix it up just a wee bit from that and make some with Nutella and marshmallow. Not to knock the family recipe or anything, but you know, if I'm frying dough, I'm making it into the most delicious donut fair food thing that I can create. But just by looking at these things, you could tell that they were gonna be delicious. Stephanie, how's it feel? It feels great! I'm so excited to have accomplished this. It feels exactly the way the recipe said it would be. Like, I feel like I, I really stuck to it and did it exactly the way you're supposed to. I'm just excited to taste them. They look- I'm so proud of myself. They look so nice. Right? They're real, they're really cute. Yeah, and you're supposed to eat them right after you cook them, and yeah. we've just gotten them out of the oil, so I mean, I think this is exactly the way they're supposed to be served. And I, and I think one cool thing that's worth calling out here is even though we're like, pressed for time and in terms of the shoot and things like that, we took extra time to experiment more with it. We were having yeah. so much fun with it, which I think is really noteworthy. Yeah. You know, in a in our hectic lives, we're like, oh man, we have so many things to do. We're like, hey, this is kind of cool. What if we throw in this? Or what if we throw in that? We got a cheese one in here. We got a Nutella one in here. Yeah, we, got we got a, a marshmallow, marshmallow one, a plain one. I'm really excited. So you also don't know what you're gonna get. You might get salty fish. You yeah. might get salty anchovy. You might get a little dessert, like an every flavored <laughs> jelly bean challenge with salty fish joy. But for as unappealing as all this sounded on paper, when everything was out of the frying pan and into my mouth, my reaction says it all. These little dough balls were outrageously good. The chewiness was out of this world. And the salty fish, great. Stephanie's a big texture gal. Oh yeah, my favorite flavor is chewy. Stephanie's huge in textures. This is, I absolutely see why this is like your favorite thing ever. Absolutely. How have we not made this? Mm. You know, it's one of those things, again, it's not easy. You have to have like an excuse to make this. Ooh. And that sentiment was pretty much universal for all the family recipes. Oh, I hope my grandma is happy because Jesus, I had to replace so many of the ingredients to suit the flavor as much as possible to make it like be as legit as I possibly could. And that's probably why I haven't made this recipe because the ingredients are not exactly the same and the preparation takes forever. Which just left us back where we began, the fart factory, <laughs> AKA my family. Oh, you need an excuse to make this, especially in this day and age where it's so much easier to just order out. Um, birthday, I guess, or a uh, family gathering, social gathering. It's, it's it's just so much easier to just order out and, and have someone cook for you, some professional chef cook for you, instead of you cooking yourself. Like, I don't know, man. Some special occasion, I guess. Emily's cabbage soup. I gotta admit, going into our final taste test, I was feeling like this one was gonna be a bit of a losing battle. I do have to admit, though, you know, it, it, we're coming off of like those delicious fritters. It's literally like a carnival food. Mm, good old it was pizza awesome. So, you know, 
meat and cabbage soup is, is it's operating at a different level. Let's would, just say that. I would say we, we should adjust our expectations maybe a yes. little bit just based on the visual, but um, but we'll see. <laughs> the visual of, you know. Aw, Stephanie is being so kind-hearted. Aw. Mepa is like, yeah, it is bad. <laughs> tomato soup with a lot of cabbage. Admittedly, not the most eye-catching, and really not the most nose-catching either. Like, this stuff has a pretty pungent smell, but it was the smell of my grandparents' house from when I was a kid. For as odd of a smell as it is, I couldn't help but smile. You know how you walk into your grandparents' house and there's just, like, a smell to it? And it's, and it's uniquely a smell for that house, and you never really smell it in any other place? This is my grandparents' house's smell that just, like, oozed from every pore of that building. And while I was certainly familiar with the smell, I didn't know anything about the taste. So after nearly three decades of avoiding trying this thing, it was finally time to sample my grandfather's soup. The flavor is very nice. The flavor's great. Yeah. The flavor's so much better than the smell. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you just kind of have to ignore the smell and go in for the flavor. Oh. It's nice and it's nice and acidic and bright, actually. It's got lots of the tomato. The cabbage gives it a little bit of earthiness. The kielbasa is like just the right amount of umami and salt. This is a very well-balanced soup. Right? I like it. The flavor is so well-balanced mm. and it hits on, there's a little bit of sour, there's a little bit of sweet, there's a little bit of salty. This is so good. It's funny. Go no wonder it's so revolting to a young mad pet because when you're a child, Anything that smell bad, you are not gonna put in your mouth. And well, I guess that's regrets, I guess. When in, we expected this episode to be just us cooking a bunch of dishes, food. But what happened when we all bit into what was passed down to us was nothing less than a ratatouille scene where Anton Ego flashes back to his childhood. So this gives me memories of the two, um, you know, people who I most closely associate with cooking, um, the, you know, special family foods in my household, which are my grandma and my dad. My grandma's side, you know, her fried dough was like, it's like the best thing I've ever eaten in my life, maybe up until today. Having a memory of that, because she's no longer with us, is really special, and this tastes so similar to the type of fried dough that she would make. It makes me so happy. And then on the other side, my dad's like zany bacala recipes that he does, and we have bacala every Christmas Eve, so I have a lot of holiday memories, I have memories of my dad, which is like very nice family memories of like wonderful times of year when we're together. This is kind of a perfect recipe, I think. And I could not be happier with the way it turned out. I imagine like summer days, I imagine my, my grandma on, on the kitchen and oh my God, I was such a complainer. I was a kid and I'm like, oh, but is there no salad? Because summers in Chile are very, very hot. There was charqui can. And I'm like, oh man, but this dish is so hot, grandma. But you know what? You never know what you have until you, you lost it. So now I, wow, this is crazy. <laughs> my grandmother, she passed away like a few years ago. She was the one that basically teach my mom uh, the recipe for this kind of soup. It has been passed on through all the family uh, because of her. My brother actually through the through was COVID and even like through the years while I was not here at home, uh, he was actually with my mom the most and he actually learned a lot of the recipes from my grandmother that she teach to my mom. He actually knows how to do a hiyako really well. Like for this little project that we were talking about, I actually asked him directly the recipe because my mom told me that he made it much better than herself, which that's actually kind of amazing knowing that now this latest generation is actually improving the recipe that we have always had before. And I think that's what's so satisfying about this whole experience. Nowadays, it's easy to just dismiss old things, right? We literally have the world's collective knowledge at our fingertips instantaneously through the internet. But today showed me how valuable the knowledge of the past is. That red book of recipes, some handwritten, some from other cookbooks, some from the local newspaper. That curated list of foods, that was my grandfather's legacy. He's childhood. And instead of just shoving it aside because the things take too long to cook or smell strange or whatever, today I decided to embrace it. We learned from it and the collective memories of our loved ones. And it showed us how valuable taking that time can actually be. In the process, we infused a bit of ourselves into it to come out on the other end with something that would make the ones that aren't here anymore proud. So in the end, despite needing to spend two days with a fish in the bathtub and me needing to take a healthy dose of Beano, the experience of reconnecting with our families is totally worth it. In fact, for Nicole and I, it was a little bittersweet because both of us realized that moments had passed us by. Oh boy, if I can only go back in time and 
uh, punch my my kid's self or push her and sit on her place and eat the chunky can. I would do it, dude. Whenever I would go visit my grandparents, they would always ask like, hey, we got some soup on. Do you want to try some? Do you want to have some? Do you want to have some? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And uh, I missed out. And I kind of look back and I'm, I'm sad about that. But I'm glad that I didn't let it pass me by this whole time and that it didn't just get lost in a cabinet or closet somewhere. But after today, I know that this makes me want to work. And the unfortunate thing is your experience is not just your experience. A lot of individuals will have that as well. Especially when you're the only child in the family. It's like, I don't do it. I don't do it. You're not going to force me. I'm not going to do it. I just don't want to do it. But if you have a brother, if you have a sister, I have a, I have a brother, I have a sister. If I'm not going to do it, my mom is going to say, see, even your brother is doing it. See, even your sister is doing it. Just eat it. It's like, fine. And then I eat it. It's like, wow, it's delicious. I'm sorry. See, I tried because of peer pressure. And it's, it's positive usage of peer pressure. Mepan didn't have a chance for, for it to happen to him. I hope it does happen to his child, his son, Oli, as well. He only have one son. Kind of sad that he doesn't have a second one. Like, honestly speaking, it's all the responsibility burdens, everything that you're experiencing right now, my pet, all the remorse, all the regrets, that, all the reminiscences that you have experienced right now, if you do not give Oli a sibling, he will experience it again in his lifetime as well. Let's not make that happen, shall we? Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it my way through this cookbook with Steph and Ollie. And who knows, maybe we'll put our own spin on it, modify it, add recipes to it, and then Ollie will be able to take that gift with him. That's really the beauty of these family recipes. They're threads that trace bits of our identities back to our ancestors, but also flow through to the next generation. These aren't just ingredients put on a page, they're a family legacy carried across time. And hey, if you want to be a part of that legacy and sample it for yourself, we've actually included all the recipes down in the description below. And please, while you're down there, if you have a family recipe, put it down in the comments. Let this video serve as a type of collective theorist cookbook so that the memories can truly live on forever. Because that, that's the true secret ingredient. And as always, my friends, remember, it's just a theory. A food theory! Bon appetit! Before you go, I want to give a big thank you to Liquid IV for sponsoring today's episode. You know, we talked a lot about slowing down and not letting the fast pace of modern life get in the way, but you know what? Sometimes it does. Going back and forth constantly from your home to your office to meetings to your cookware store because you accidentally burned a pop making a family recipe, naturally you're going to get dehydrated. Hydrated. And that's where Liquid IV's Energy Multiplier comes in. Liquid IV does an amazing job of acting as a midday energy boost right when you feel that 3 p.m. slump coming on. It makes you feel like a new person. And if you're like, well, that's great, Matt Pat, but my midday slump is bad, like cabbage soup smell bad, well, it's also got 100 milligrams of natural caffeine per stick to give you that extra push you need. All of that while actually hydrating you. You're focused, you're alert, you're ready to cook every darn recipe in your grandfather's cookbook. Speaking of things with unique flavors, the Yuzu pineapple has got to be my personal favorite of the batch. But you don't have to take my word for it. You can just go out and try it for yourself. Whether it's the yuzu pineapple or something else, like the mango tamarind, you cannot go wrong with Liquid IV. Thank you again to Liquid IV for sponsoring today's episode. And as always, my friends, I will see you next week. Well, thank you so much, my pet, for sharing your experience with us. It's a very relatable experience. For me, I'm glad that when my grandparents alive, I get to eat together with them. Be it the good dishes, the bad dishes, be it the good moments, the bad moments, the, 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 yeah. Um, it is what makes us humans, especially in this day and age, in this modern day and age, too true, too far away. It's so much easier to, to just order out. Like, 10 minutes later, there's food. Instead of preparing, instead of preparing for one hour, two hours, or more. It's so much easier. Moreover, there's a sense of accomplishment. Like, the person cooking, cooks something, and the person eating is enjoying it. There's a sense of accomplishment, sense of gratification, sense of gratitude and appreciation. That, hey, they thank us, we thank them. It's a mutual, I think it's a mutual human compassion thing, I guess. But hey, that's just a theory. A full theory. Thanks for watching. Bon appetit.
and I hope to see you all in my next video. Thank you so much. Subscribe. Thank you. Subscribe.